Okay, in today's lesson, we're going to talk about the Oregon country and the Oregon Trail. Really um, historical significance to Nebraska because the Oregon Trail went right through the middle of our state. So I hope you find this interesting. Okay, by the 1820s, you know, the land um, just to the west of the Appalachians all the way up to the uh, Mississippi River have, have started to fill up. And so people are still coming into the country. Immigrants are still looking for land. But very few of them are going to cent uh, settle in, this, in the Great Plains of the United States. It's too dry. They don't have enough rain. And they don't have enough timber and resources to, to build the things they need. So they skip right through, you know, the Great Plains, and they head to the Oregon country. Little do they know, though, that underneath their feet is one of the greatest water reserves on Earth, the Ogallala Aquifer. They don't have the technology or the knowledge you know, to get this, uh, this water out. So, believe it or not, this great land, this great grassland, is going to be just skipped over. They said it's too dry. It can't be farmed. The great American desert. Um, and uh, they keep pushing west all the way to Oregon. Now, the Oregon Territory itself is very different. Um, if you go along the coast, along the coast of uh, Oregon in present-day Washington, the land is very fertile, lots of rainfall, good for farming. Up in the mountains, along the coastal mountains, lots of forests. It's kind of a temperate rainforest. Uh, lots of fur-bearing animals. Remember, way back uh, in one of the earlier lessons, we talked about how Yankee traders had sailed all the way from Boston, all the way around South America, to trade with the natives along the coast for fur. Um, so that's a different region than the Willamette uh, Valley area along the coastal plains. And then further to the east, between the coastal mountains and uh, other mountains, is kind of a big barren desert. Uh, very different. I mean, you go from heavy rain to nearly no rain in just a few, you know, probably 50 to 100 miles. Okay, so the, co uh, the, the climate of Oregon is very uh, different depending on where you settle. So as you might well imagine, most of these early pioneers are trying to get to the coastal um, valleys, the coastal plains, right along the Pacific Ocean and the coastal mountains. Kind of got ahead of myself here, didn't I? All right. As I say, you know, it's varied geography. You know, you have the uh, fertile land along the Pacific coast. No, that's not wide enough. Okay. Fine farmland along the Willamette River and the lands around Puget Sound. You know, I talked about this. Dense forest covered the coastal mountain range. Great for hunting um, fur-bearing animals. There's so, so there's going to be lots of mountain men and fur traders and fur trappers up there. And then just further to the east of that is barren dry plateau between the coastal mountains and the Rocky Mountains. All right. So in the early 1800s, we have four countries that are competing for this land. The United States, Britain, Spain, and Russia. Remember in one of my lessons on the, manifest, I mean on the Monroe Doctrine, I talked about how Russia had started to lay claim to Alaska and along the Pacific Northwest of, of, of present-day United States. Well, here's what happens. The United States and Great Britain... You know, they've already gone through the War of 1812. They're tired of war. They're like, hey, I'll tell you what we're going to do. Let's just agree to occupy the land jointly. All citizens would have equal rights. Now, because Spain and Russia don't have a lot of settlers there, they kind of withdraw their claim. So now the land, for all intents and purposes, belongs equally to the United States and Great Britain. Well, at first, the, uh, the first people to really travel to the Oregon Territory are fur traders, mountain men, okay? They lived off the land. You know, they spent the winters with the Native American tribes. They used their wits, their skills, their courage to trap animals, trade with the natives. And, my gosh, they can make a huge profit off of these, especially beaver pelts, okay? These furs were sold to European countries, especially Great Britain, who made these furs into felt hats, very top hats. Any, any gentleman in Europe wanted a fine beaver felt hat. So they made a huge amount of money, you know, trading with uh, the natives, you know, for furs, especially for the ones they don't catch themselves. 
And then the ones that they do catch, you know, that they, you know, they skin them, they uh, scrape them, they preserve the hides. And then each July, each July, the mountain men met at a fur trade, usually in, it's usually in Wyoming, but it's a predetermined location. It's called a rendezvous, a rendezvous. Rendezvous means, you know, it's a French word for get-together. So these guys would get together once a year. They'd bring in all the fur that they had uh, acquired throughout the winter, and they brought it to the fur, uh, fur rendezvous where they would trade it with, uh, you know, fur traders. And they would make a huge amount of money. But, uh, man, those rendezvous were a very raucous time, lots of drinking, gambling, fist fights. There's competitions. There's shooting competitions. There's running competitions, wrestling, horse riding and all that kind of stuff. And some of these guys would blow their whole year's wages, like in a week. You know, they would also trade for the things that they needed. You know, maybe a new knife or gun, gunpowder, ammuni- you know, lead for, for ammunition. They would might buy some flour, some coffee, tobacco, some of the things that they couldn't trade for with the natives. And um, hopefully they'd make a little bit of extra money besides that. But a lot of these guys went back into the mountains and blown all their money. But by the um, late 1830s, you know, this demand for, for beaver fur really begins to fall off. Everybody in Europe is kind of falling out of favor, and the fur trade begins to die. All right? So the way they've made their living for the last 30 years goes away. So there's got to be another way for these guys who know a lot about the Pacific Northwest and how to get to certain places um, how can they use that knowledge, that skill, to make some money? Well, we'll talk about that in just a minute. Okay, so the first white settlers. Now, I'm not, I mean, when I say settlers, I mean people who actually put down permanent, you know, roots. It's certainly not going to be the mountain men because they're going to just travel around trading with the natives, looking for animals. But the first permanent settlers are missionaries. I better change color here. Missionaries. They're the first one to permanently settle in the Oregon country. They wanted to convert Native Americans to Christianity, and they helped to stir up interest in the new territories. They'd often write home to their families and friends back east, tell them what a great uh, location this is, how fertile the land is, how uh, mild the climate is, and this really stirs up a lot of interest for the people out east to come to this new land of Oregon. Unfortunately, guess what the missionaries also bring with them? disease again. Disease, smallpox, kills a lot, off a lot of the Native Americans. The Native Americans retaliate, even kill some of the missionaries who bring this curse with them. So this is, is a difficult life for the missionaries as well, and as you might well imagine, for the natives who become sick. So the people back east hear all these stories, you know, the stories from the mountain men, the stories from the fur traders, the stories from the missionaries. They talk about wheat that grows uh, well over a man's head, turnips as big as five feet around, all these tall tales. And this really stirs up interest in the, uh, in the people in the East to begin to come to Oregon. So, who's going to take them there? I mean, these people don't know where to go, what mountains to skip, what mountains to go over, where's the passes, where's the valley, where's water, right? That's where those old mountain men and fur traders come back into play they decide that they can start leading pioneers west. So the routes pi- followed by pioneers er- early spring, beginning in 1843, are some of those same routes that the mountain men had been taking since the early 1800s. Now, they have to travel over 2,000 miles in five months. Okay? They have to leave in the spring when the weather begins to warm, And they've got to get there before the onset of winter again. They can't get stranded up in the mountains, in the Rockies or the Cascades. So they've got to get going, you know. So they have to go um, 2,000 miles in five months. And God forbid if someone gets sick or unfortunately someone passes away, you know, they might stop, bury that person, maybe their child or their wife or their husband. But they can't linger. they got to go. So they have to leave that grave behind, probably never to see it again. So the Oregon Trail is scattered with thousands, probably, of unmarked graves of people that have died along the way. Along the way, they traded with Native Americans. You always see these Western stories about these wagon trains being attacked. That really wasn't the case. 
Um, oftentimes they traded with the natives along the way, especially since the natives knew they had no intentions of staying uh, in the Great Plains. You know, they're just passing along. Uh, uh, so this is an opportunity for both the natives and the people traveling to Oregon to get some of the things that they, they want and need. So they trade with the Native Americans. They have to pass up. Uh, they're going to have to pass through uh, streams that are swollen from spring rain. They're going to have to go over rutted roads or, or roads that have been flooded or eroded away. They're going to have to battle thunderstorms and lightning storms, hail, possibility of fire, and, of course, the ever-present danger of sickness. So this is a very, very difficult time. But more than 50,000 pioneers reached Oregon whoops, between... 1840 and 1860. So now we have 50,000 people that have basically bypassed the center part of the United States to get to territory that's owned jointly by the United States and Great Britain. Now, you might ask yourself, how many did Great Britain send there? Not as many. So even though this is jointly owned by the United States and Great Britain, most of the settlers in the Oregon country are Americans which is going to lead us eventually to go, hey, why are we sharing this with Great Britain? Okay, so there you have it. The Oregon Trail, this is kind of a little synopsis, kind of an overview of it. We'll discuss it in more detail in class. Thank you.